Hey everybody, um, thanks for tuning in. I have with me uh, Dr. Ramesh Raskar. Dr. Ramesh Raskar is an associate director at the MIT Media Labs. Many of you know what that is. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about AI and its impact, especially in a country like India in the future. Thanks, Ramesh, for making the time to come and talk with us. Good to see you, Balam. Excellent. So, um, Dr. Raskar is extremely accomplished. Um, and all you need to go is to go to um, YouTube and, um, and uh, search for uh, searching, looking around corners. It's an absolute brilliant talk. Highly recommend it. Uh, I would have loved to take all the time to talk just about that. But unfortunately, we are not going to have time for that. We're going to be focusing uh, on the next set of things that he is seeing um, that we are yet to see. So the topic is going to be mainly focused on AI and Gen AI. So um, first question, um, Ramesh, are we in an AI bubble? How should we think about chatbots? Uh, what is beyond chatbots? Uh, good question. I think there is definitely overinvestment in certain areas and underinvestment in other areas. And I think, you know, thanks to ChatGPT, about a year ago, uh, there is a, a lot of excitement about generative AI. Uh, but what we realize is that AI is, the approaches to AI are so much bigger than generative AI, not by a factor of 2x or 3x, but maybe by 100x. And generative AI is going to be a very tiny component. Important, but still a tiny component of the overall, overall revolution uh, in AI. So I think there's a lot of underinvestment in those other areas. Uh, and the second thing is I, I like to talk about, are we solving problems that are more like an office assistant or problems that are more like an engineer or more like a scientist? And a lot of the office assistant uh, like problems like chatbots and summarization and making slides better or making videos better uh, and so on uh, is where a lot of the energy is in right now. And honestly, you know, every time OpenAI releases a new feature or BART releases a new feature, you know, a lot of those things are going to be wiped out. So this is definitely overinvestment and a bubble in that office assistant area uh, as opposed to other areas. That's an excellent characterization. Um, I was just listening to your talk and for the first time um, I've heard this concept. You talked about screen AI versus dimensional AI. Uh, what do you mean by that? And you talked in the context of the moat and a lot of the audience here are venture capitalists uh, and startups who are always likely trying to build modes or find modes. I mean, that's, you know, that's the goal of every startup and every VC of how do you create a strong moat venture that requires the minimal e effort possible. And I kind of, if on those two axes of moat versus effort, I will put kind of screen AI at the bottom left, which is, you know, these are like two kids of MIT, out of MIT or a top university can create a venture uh, with like a few days of programming. And those are easy to create, but easily appended. And I call them kind of screen AI companies. These are chatbots, office assistants, creative tools, uh, often thin wrappers, reusing existing open source models and so on. And again, you know, you, you don't really have, you know, much of a barrier to entry uh, from others. As opposed to dimensional AI are companies, you know, that are going to impact the hundred trillion dollars worth of GDP, you know, uh, of the world every year. And all those sectors, some of them are very unsexy sectors, you know. Like, like what? Uh, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say it something <laughs> specifically, but uh, things that a typical tech entrepreneur will not consider, you know, think about mining, think about hospital process efficiencies, you know, think about the work of nurses, think about HR. A lot of the sectors kind of are not touched by AI right now, and we can be sure that over the next five years, everything in that $100 trillion economy uh, is going to get impacted with AI. So that's a massive opportunity. And that's dimensional AI because that's in the real world. It's in a multidimensional world. It requires multidimensional teams. You need technologists, you need sector experts, and you also need a multidimensional execution because it's not a piece of software you can just deploy online and you expect it to take off on its own. You know, it, ha it has to go through multiple channels. You know, you have to uh, test it in with alpha customers and so on. So this dimensional AI companies uh, is where there's a lot of underinvestment. And to be honest, you know, a lot of venture capitalists come from, you know, very ex exciting areas like e-commerce or uh, SaaS software and so on. And they may or may not map to these dimensional AI companies. And the reason for that is we were so, for the last 20 years, we have been so fixated on the notion of digital transformation. And again, it created trillions of dollars of values in digital transformation, which is different than AI transformation. 
In digital transformation, we needed two things that made the transformation somewhat difficult. One is you need some interoperability. So if you have a business and you have vendors, you and your vendors have to be in the same digital system. So you need that interoperability. And second is that every entity uh, had to, uh, you know, had to create structured data. Uh, and that was complicated, right? Um, those two problems, interoperability and structured data, are not needed for an AI transformation. So just like the cliched example of you know, countries skipping landlines and moving to mobile phones, you see many businesses, a lot of these boring businesses, skipping the dual transformation and going straight to an AI transformation. Because in AI, you and your vendors don't need to have the same interoperable pipes and individuals can create unstructured data that can all be fed to AI systems. So I understand the unstructured data part, but uh, how, how come interoperability is not required? Yeah, so as you know, if we take health as an example, you know, everybody had to be on one common system like Epic. Um, and now what's happening is that every entity can just dump their data in some intermediate represent, uh, some representation and the machine learning models can be independent. As long as the models can talk to each other, the raw data doesn't have to be in an interoperable manner. Got it. So a lot of the work which is exciting and which is something I think we in India are good at, it looks like orchestration is required. We can almost pick any field like logistics or nursing or any of those. Uh, but the underlying technology you feel is there or almost there? A lot of the pieces of the puzzle are already here. You know, AI is not that different from other aspects of software in that sense. The plumbing, the orchestration that's required is often here. Uh, but again, innovation always happens at the edges, right? So the infrastructure often is around. Uh, and that's also the magical thing about AI, right? I think AI is so similar to previous software revolution in terms of the infrastructure. What is not here is the talent, you know, the, the ML dev, the ML scientist, the ML ops is not here. So I think it's much easier to go from the current call software system to the AI systems, but I think the talent is going to be the biggest barrier to get which, this which is, which is good news for us because um, talent is something we have in plenty, and especially if it needs to be shaped uh, in a particular direction, we can absolutely do that. Um, I just want to jump topics, um, and uh, you, you just gave a fascinating lecture on decentralized AI. Can you touch on some key elements of that? Because in India, again, we, are, we don't have the landlines. We can go jump straight into the mobile equivalent of an AI uh, and can build the safeguards in place, which maybe developed nations cannot, yeah. just like we've done in payments and so on and so forth. So the centralization, decentralization is a, a very important concept, not just in terms of business, but also kind of the ethical deployment of AI. So right now, if you think about the companies that are delivering AI solutions, they're centralizing data, like petabytes of data, they're centralizing compute, literally hundreds of millions of dollars worth of compute. But more importantly, they're also centralizing the governance. They are making all the decisions on what we mean by responsible AI. They are making the decisions on who the winners and losers can be. And the centralization of those three things, data, compute, and governance, is actually not only scary, but also unsustainable. Uh, and just the way we think about society of the mind, you know, um, uh, even the human, the way the human brain works, uh, and many experts have said this already, is that, you know, more likely we're go go not going to have this one single central AI, but many AIs, a multi kind of a multi-AI system that all talk to each other. So there's a fintech AI, there's an e-commerce AI, there's a health AI, and they're all running locally. We have our own individual digital twins running on our phones, and they're all negotiating with each other. Um, and, and uh, you know, are doing financial transactions, but also over time, all getting together better. So this notion of shared prosperity is very critical. And to achieve that, we have to switch to decentralized AI. And if you have to move decentralized AI, in my opinion, you have solved four problems. One is when things are decentralized, the data is also siloed. So how do you create AI that works across data silos? That's privacy. Second is, when things are decentralized, you can't trust what each entity is doing, so we need verifiable AI. Third is you need some incentives for the entities to work together, so that's kind of a data market or model market. And the fourth is some kind of a UX, because now that all these things are decentralized, you won't have like a single exchange for it. So we need unique exchanges, unique UX, that's kind of AI first. Phenomenal, and these are something you're working on at, at, at Media Labs? Yeah, so we have a center at, uh, at MIT Media Lab called Decentralized Society, and decentralized AI is a significant uh, aspect of that. Brilliant. Would love to come back and touch on that uh, at some point. But 
Uh, I just want to jump to uh, AI in health. I know you are passionate about it. You've done a lot of phenomenal work in eye care. Um, I looked at some of your past work there. Um, but what is to come? What is five years later? What 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 can what what will we think? Oh yeah, that's kind of normal now. I'm like yeah, Bala, I think what I realized one day is that we can solve healthcare overnight. Overnight, overnight, um, and it's mostly a matter of distribution of information, wisdom, and incentives. Uh, think about diabetes, right? Um, a, 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 a journey for a diabetic patient is not that different from your journey from one part of the city to another part of the city. And you use Waze or Google Maps, and what it does is, when you're using a map navigation, is crowdsource information from every person who's trying to go from the point A to point B, not as the your point A and point B, but their point A and point B, and crowdsources all that information, and segment by segment figures out that if this is your journey, let me tell you how the journey for others have been for those segments and pieces together a story for you and creates the best path for you and along the way gives you turn by turn navigations of what you should do. And a patient journey is not that different. You know, diseases like diabetes have been around for a long time and we understand them really well. We understand what works, what doesn't work. The, the problem has mostly been data. We are not able to do, in the startup, we, we like to call it product market fit. In the medical world, it's just kind of a patient solution fit. Um, and if we can find those right matches, we can take every patient through their journey and take them to the right place and dramatically reduce the burden on current healthcare systems. At the same time, you know, focus on all the things that we care about in healthcare, preventative, you know, uh, during care, and also the foresights. Um, so many aspects of healthcare can be solved overnight if we use a decentralized, decentralized approach that, is, that, that I just talked about. So I'm very hopeful that in the next five years, uh, you know, we will come back and say, wow, to understand your health journey, you are knocking the doors, you went to this hospital, you went to this lab, and you, you know, searched, you know, day in and day out on these websites, and all you needed was this, you know, patient journey app that looks no different than your traffic navigation app that could have taken you all the way. Um, so I think most of the information is already here. The way the clinical trials are done is very inefficient. Um, you know, of course, they're done on a very small cohort. So I think almost every aspect of healthcare is actually just an information asymmetry problem. And we can create a global AI for health from all these local AIs. Fascinating. Actually, one of the startups here, a company called Healthify, uh, Healthify Me, they're trying to do that for health and fitness, not so much for uh, cure, uh, but to create those kind of paths by crowd crowdsourcing information. Um, this is very fascinating. Thank you. Uh, lastly, I want to sort of step back a little bit. Um, a lot of the people who are listening to this are entrepreneurs or people who have um, who are at various stages in their life. Um, and uh, one of the most fascinating uh, research that uh, when I was researching what you've done, uh, one of your most fascinating lectures was uh, what's about failure. <laughs> um, so uh, people think of, you know, when they look at your profile, you know, you are sort of the apex predator of, uh, you know, research and professor. I don't know if they're predators in the professor world, but maybe they are. <laughs> <laughs> but you're at the top of the heap, MIT, you know, Media Lab uh, up there. Um, but people don't realize that, you know, even very successful people uh, were not linearly always successful. They had their own pitfalls. Would love to know about, if you can summarize the, what you had experienced and what would you tell people uh, in terms of succeeding and what it takes to succeed? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I come from a very modest family in Nasik, very close to Bombay. Grew up in a tiny house with four siblings, you know, had almost no money, but my parents believe in education and that kind of stayed with us. And I think when you're doing research, when you're trying to invent new things, I've done a lot of startups, uh, now we're in a venture studio fund. Um, I think it's, you know, you have to kind of celebrate your success, but also celebrate your failure. Uh, we all had, you know, um, you know our, our, our share of failures. I think the main message I gave in the talk uh, I gave about failures is that the world is conspiring. Uh, there's always this conspiration. It tells you this ridiculously positive messages <laughs> and it romanticizes things that shouldn't be romanticized and we should not be misguided uh, and we should look at those those signals you know that seem very positive and kind of take them not at face value but you know kind of personalize them and take it forward 
And uh, uh, you know, the, one of the examples I show in that video is that you see this beautiful rainbow. Uh, you know, I, I took the picture from the top <laughs> floor of the MIT Media Lab. And when I see a rainbow, you know, the, the natural reaction is, oh, that's a beautiful rainbow. You know, chase the rainbow to, to, you know, to the end. But, you know, we are scientists. We know that rainbow <laughs> is just an illusion. So don't follow rainbow. You know, just take, a, just take the road, just take the elevator to, to where you're going. Uh, so it's one thing to be inspired by the signals in the world and another to find your own, own, own practical path. And so, you know, one of the reasons I started this venture studio, uh, C10 Labs, is to really flip the venture capital model as well. Uh, because I think the VC community is not that different uh, from, you know, how we watch kind of Bollywood movies or how we watch cricket matches, uh, you know, or how we even sell lottery tickets. And there's this, this romanticization saying, you know, if it's in you, you'll make it. You know, you should give up everything in life and you should work on this. But the VCs, on the other hand, are just running a portfolio, <laughs> exactly. you know? So it feels very unfair to say 95% of you are going to die and I'm going to make money from this 5% of you. And, but get on a stage and say very beautifully with very Bollywood style, you know, dialogues that says, if it's in you, you'll do it. So I just thought that's very unfair to the, to the startup ecosystem. So actually about 10 years ago, I gave a talk at NASCOM uh, where I said, you know, uh, um, you know promoting entrepreneurship may be toxic to our society. Um, and it was kind of early in my thought process. And then, and that talk, I, I talked about this flipped venture capital model. Uh, and now we call it studio, right? That's, the studio model is basically a flipped venture capital model where you don't expect individuals to come pitch a company, but you want them to come pitch themselves. And so I think in the world of AI, it's even more necessary because if you don't, then you'll get a lot of individuals just doing screen AI companies and the VCs are just going to spray and pray, see what comes out. But I think what we can do for this ecosystem, not just to be highly, uh, create highly lucrative businesses, businesses, but also do something that's socially responsible for this young talent and also socially responsible for what's important for the society, is to actually flip that model and see together as an ecosystem, what should we build? How can we go into areas where we're not getting enough attention, you know, and take those resources you know, in climate, in health, in transportation, in this dimensional AI world, and create extremely lucrative ventures with this young talent. And that's kind of the idea behind uh, the C10 uh, Venture Studio as well. Okay. So that kind of comes from my, my realization of my failure, which is sometimes the signals can make you feel very romantic, the romantic sense about it. Well said. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's super important. Um, so uh, Dr. Ramesh, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure. So um, I'm sure a lot of people watching would would, uh, would love this and uh, can take a lot of valuable lessons from this. Thank you again. Thank you, Bala. <laughs>